It's been said that the choice to make good choices is the best choice that you can make. In everything that we do, we choose direction. Whether good direction or bad direction. Life is a matter of choices. Well, we're free to choose our actions, every choice that we make has results and determines how our lives are going to unfold and who we will become in the end. Sometimes uh, it's minor decisions, in fact, that change our lives forever. And, you know, we're just launching into 2023, a new year is before us. And there's so many choices that are going to be put before us on how we're going to live out this year. And that's, should God grant us another year in this body. Of course, all of us start out wanting to make the very best choices. We start out the new year with hope that this year we will decide to do the right things and to avoid doing what is wrong. But based on statistics, not many people will actually succeed on, in keeping track, on track with their goals and their dreams for the coming year. There's so many factors on, on how our lives will turn. And the Bible is, is, is so full of examples of people's choices and, and the consequences of their decision. You start from Genesis and you see the story unfold. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Many people are starting out on the right path with good hearts and, and good resolutions and good intentions to serve God wholeheartedly with everything they are. But over time, that resolve is put to the test through either temptations or hardships. We see suddenly in the valley of decision whether we have a choice to go right or to go wrong. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I've taken the latter. I've done what is wrong. So, in the Old Testament, we see examples of people living out their lives and making choices facing temptations and hardships and how they're going to respond. Sadly, we see um, examples of how people have gone and made wrong choices. And the fallout of all of that is laid out upon the pages. Now, these examples were given to us, not prophetically so that we would follow suit, but that we would look and see from above the story unfold and where God would show us that we need to act differently than what was exemplified in the story. Now, examples of this laid out again and again. Today, we're going to talk about one example. And there's, within this lesson, in the children of, of Israel's uh, deliverance from Egypt and their sojourning through the desert and their conquering of the promised land. There are so many l different kinds of lessons on different levels. You know, like I've been amazed, I don't, know, I, I don't know about you, but when you read some of these stories, you can see one thing from it one time and then a, a whole new lesson on a whole different level comes through the next time you read it as the Spirit draws your attention to something that he's teaching through the Word. Um, now Moses, as you are all aware, he, he was the author of the first five books of the Bible. And he spent much time with God. I think when we look at Moses and we see the story of Moses, there's not many people that spent more quality time or had more 
visible and powerful encounters with God than Moses. He was the one who was called upon Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And when he came off the mountain, he had spent so much time in the presence of the glory of God that his face was shining in brilliance. And he had to wear a veil over his face so the people could even look at him because he shone with the radiant glory of God because he was near to the Lord and it just, see, it just filled his being. He radiated the powers of God because God is holy. And you can't be spending time in God's presence without being changed by that. So Moses, further to this, from the start of his involvement with the ministry of delivering Israel from slavery, God gave Moses and his brother, Aaron, a wooden staff. And at God's command, Moses used the staff that he was given for performing a great many miracles. And those miracles aided in the deliverance of the people and provided for their needs. For example, Moses used his staff under God's direction, raising it up over the Red Sea providing deliverance for the people across. And then he raised it up again as the enemies were coming down upon them and God defeated the enemy by closing the sea up over Pharaoh's army. In number 17, the Israelites, they were in the desert. And they were grumbling against God because it appeared that their needs or their desires were not being met properly while traveling through the desert. They were thirsty. Desert's not a friendly place. Moses cried out to God to help him. And we read in verses 5 to 7 of Numbers chapter 17. The people were complaining that they were thirsty. And Moses, the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with you which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out for the people uh, of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So the staff of Moses was a precious gift given to Moses and Aaron, the two of them, to use to help protect and provide for the people of Israel, God's people. So many incredible things were done through this gift. The problem is, though, that the people started to look at the staff as almost being some sort of magic wand and Moses as a magician. And this illusion needed to be broken, so we see several chapters later in Numbers chapter 20, from Numbers 17 to Numbers 20, we begin to read starting with verse 1 and 20. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin. Sounds familiar, eh? Zin. And they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and they said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates. And there is no water to drink. It's hot and dry in a desert. This fact has been burned into my memory. See, a couple of years ago, and I think I've said this before in the past, that God gave 
me the opportunity to travel with a group of people from 100 miles here to the land of Israel. And um, together, during that time when we went to Israel, we entered the Sinai Desert. And we went to the desert in an air-conditioned bus, and we parked that bus in the middle of the desert, and we got out of the bus, and we went to see a full-scale replica of the tent of meeting which had been set up in the desert as part of this national park program that the Israeli government had. So we walked and we went to this full-size tent of meeting area. Everything was in the dimensions that it was in the scriptures. And when I exited that bus, I tell you, the heat of the sun on this baby face was unbelievably unbearable. I don't know how hot it was, but it was approaching 50 degrees, or maybe it was 50 degrees, I don't know. But it was so hot. It was just blazing hot. And I, I thought, boy, I better get some sunscreen on, because if I don't put some sunscreen on, I'm going to be fried. <laughs> so I grabbed my sunscreen out of my, out of my backpack and slathered it all over my face, and I thought, well, maybe I would have put a little bit extra on just because. Yeah, bad choice. Bad choice. See, when it's like that hot, and you come out of an air-conditioned bus into that kind of heat, your body goes, <laughs> and you start to sweat. And I sweat, and I sweated, and beads of sweat ran down my face across my eyes, and the sunscreen went into my eyes, and it was horrid. It was horrid. Everyone else was enjoying this wonderful experience of the tabernacle, and I'm like, oh, this is so neat. Oh, this is so neat. That's how it felt. Like It was just like, oh. And I'm just kicking myself. I'm like, why in the world did I do that? Never again, but it was too late. So yeah, I made my way back to the bus again ahead of the whole group because I couldn't take it. So I sat on the bus while everyone else continued the little tour that they had there. Not a little tour, it was a big tour. And then we went to another place in the desert where the children of Israel were rumored to have been. And we walked into this place. And I was, my eyes are still burning. And that heat was just so intense. I couldn't help but think, my goodness, it's only been four hours out here, and I can hardly take this. I can't wait to get back into that air-conditioned bus and get back to my hotel room and have a shower. Then I started to think. It's like God was like, yeah, see, son, you're weak. How weak are you? In the desert, you're, you're this tourist in this desert, but these children of Israel were put in the desert, and they had to endure what I was enduring for four hours for you know, the whole, their whole life, 40 years. So, that puts it in context, you see. We're not so much different than the children of Israel. We look at the scriptures and we see that the Israelites were constantly complaining and sometimes we look at that kind of with haughty eyes and go, those guys, how could they do that? Look at what God did for them and they're complaining and they're murmuring and they're, you know what? Human beings are the same today as they were back then. In our natural state, in our natural selves, when we are encountering painful circumstances like this, we would be tempted to do exactly the same thing that the Israelites fell into. Despite so many miracles and provisions and the protection God brought to them, Despite the fact that God had led them out of slavery in Egypt by His miraculous power, the desert, desert conditions they by the Egyptians surrounded by made them forget how brutally they had been formerly treated by the Egyptian slave drivers whose soldiers whipped their backs and forced them to a labor and misery for nothing. In their discomfort in the desert sun, they began to forget how bad their enslavement had once been. They began to fantasize about the good old days before their desert travels. At least Egypt had grain and figs and pomegranates and all these other exotic delicacies to consume. Even though as slaves, they would rarely, 
if ever, be able to feast or enjoy them or even taste them. After all, Moses and Aaron, their leaders, had promised them that God would be leading them to this promised land flowing with milk and honey. But despite this freedom from slavery, all they had seen so far for years was endless hot desert with the exception of the odd oasis along the way. And all they had to eat was manna and quail. No milk, no honey, no figs, no pomegranates, no grain. And now all of them were thirsty. They were so uncomfortable in the hot sun to the point that their hearts turned away from the living God. They became angry with God. They became angry with God's appointed leaders over them for leading them out into this desert. And this desert surrounded them. And their hearts longed to return to Egypt. This story is a shadowy image of how things go in the spirit in the Christian life. Before we were believers, we lived in a land of spiritual slavery. I don't know if you remember before you walked with Christ, but Satan and his soldiers forced us to work for him as slaves. And all around us, there was what appeared to be good food to eat that would satisfy our spirits, but we were never permitted to eat of it. We were only given bitter table scraps and meager rations. Well, they forced us in hatred to work for them. We are beaten and oppressed by the devil's cruelty. But then God, by his mercy, heard our cry under the whip of our oppressors, and he saved us by his grace. We were set free from slavery after Jesus, God's only son, came to be our Passover lamb. Jesus was sacrificed. Miraculous blood was applied to the doorposts of our hearts. And we were miraculously delivered from death into life. And we were set free from slavery into freedom. We went out into the world's desert, away from land of captivity. And the devil pursued us. And he dogged us. And he tried to bring us back into his captivity and back into to press us into his service once again. But God was with us. And God has delivered us. And the devil who pursued us failed in that attempt to enslave us once again. We watch our enemy fall. We watch, our, wait, we watch God deliver us with his great and wonderful miracles. The same path he made for our escape was the path that he used to destroy the enemy as the enemy tried to pursue. But soon after, we find ourselves again in this wasteland of a world. The, de the desert heat made us desperate for quenching our spiritual thirst. The barrenness of this desert that we live in, and we offer often find ourselves wandering through, makes us hungry for more. It makes us hunger for the promised land. It makes us thirst for the water of, of the Spirit, water of life. But all we see is this wilderness of sin all around us. Yeah, it's true. Once in a while we encounter an oasis where God refreshes us, where God feeds us some, some extra provision. And then it's back out into the desert again until God comes, we come to a bitter water and God turns it miraculously into fresh, clean, drinkable water and we're, our thirst is satisfied. All the, mean, all the time in the meanwhile, we find ourselves complaining. Why does life have to be so tough like this, God? Are, are you even with us? Why are we in this horrible place? God's calling us to trust Him and to be thankful for the provisions that He's given because every morning His mercies are new. Every morning there is the manna of His Word for us to feast on. All we have to do is eat of it and thank Him. There is meat as well that we can feast on that He gives us. 
for our provisions while we're in that place. But we have to realize that our natural propensity is to grumble and to complain. Manna, 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 manna. All we get is manna. I want some more. I want some figs. I want some grapes. I want some, I think in one place in the Old Testament it was onions or leeks or something. I want some onions. No more of this manna, manna, manna all the time. God's Word, my friends, is life. It's life-giving. But our sin nature wants more. So, the Israelites, in the desert of Zin, their hearts wandered continually and strayed, and they longed for Egypt. But, you see, the devil is a deceiver. He's the father of all lies. He gets us to think about what we came from, and the eye candy that's out there. Oh, Egypt had so many grapes and figs and crops of grain. Oh, don't you remember the lush orchards? Yeah, but don't you remember that you weren't permitted to taste of that at all because you were in slavery. You were enslaved there. There was no orchards for you. There was no grape vines for you. It was nothing but a mirage in the desert. Friends, we get angry at God sometimes. We're tempted to get angry at Him. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're obedient in our hearts and we go, thank you, Lord. Help me to endure. Help me to endure. But every day we come to new things, right? And every day our resolve gets tested. We get angry at our appointed leaders for not leading us to the grapes and figs and whatever else that Egypt had. Where's this land of Canaan that God promised? Okay, you get the point. So, in verse 6, we read, continuing, Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak, to, speak so that rock before their eyes, and it will pour forth its water. You'll bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So, when the people complained, Moses and Aaron, they did the right thing. They fell before the Lord. They fell before him in prayer, and they asked God, on, God, you see the, the plight of your people. You see the need for water, but you also see that they're terrible grumblers and complainers. Help us, Lord. Meet our need, O oh God. Show yourself. Help us. Show us what we should do. And the glory of the Lord visited Moses and Aaron in that moment, and it shone around them. And God instructed them on what they should do to participate with Him to meet the people's needs. He told them not only what they ought to do, but how they ought to do it. So Moses, how did he respond to this wonderful revelation from God? So Moses took his staff. Took, so Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, verse 9, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm, and he struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock all drank. Yeah. This is an example, okay? Moses was one of the most awesome examples of how a leader ought to live. He was God's chosen leader to lead those people, but even Moses, despite, despite having so many encounters with God, he just had an encounter with God, a power encounter with God. And seeing God's power active on so many different incredible levels, you know, he had problems just like any other man. Because despite being a child of God who had been saved along with the rest of his community from a life of slavery in Egypt, Moses was a sinner just like everyone else in his community. And despite the call of God on him, 
He was subject to succumbing to the weakness of his flesh. And in this case, when Moses was so frustrated, he sinned against the Lord and against the Lord's decree. Aaron was with him. They didn't trust God's word to them when it was just there. It just appeared. God just told them what they should do. First of all, God didn't call Moses and Aaron to chastise the people. That wasn't his calling. Moses was frustrated. And in the flesh, you can see why. But God had compassion upon his people. He wanted to do something in his people to meet their need. And he wanted Moses and Aaron to be participators with him. But Moses began to depend on his gift to do the work of God. Rather than on the Lord God who had given him that gift, Moses decided to do it his own way. They weren't called to use the staff. They weren't called to use the gift that God had given them that, had done, that, had, that God had used so many times to work so many miracles. They weren't called to use it in this occasion. See, God wanted to break this fixation on the staff. God wanted to give them another gift to use into the circumstances. It was actually a superior gift. In this case, they didn't have to do anything except call upon the Lord and God would cause water to rush forth from the rock. God gave them a gift of prayer. In the moment of weakness, Moses let his frustration get the best of him. The people were complaining for the millionth time and Moses had had enough, so he was going to do something about it. God told him, Moses, speak to the rock. But Moses took the staff of God, the gift that God had given him, and he smote the rock, not just once, but he did it twice for emphasis. As if to say, God has gifted me to put you sinners in your place with my gift that God gave me. You see? The sin? Oh, my goodness. He said, listen, you rebels, must we bring you this water of the rock? And Moses raised his arm and struck the rock with the staff twice. Moses got it wrong. It wasn't him or his giftings that God would bring water to quench the people's thirst to stop them from complaining. God loved his people. He wanted to provide with his water for them. All Moses was required to do is to speak the word of God. In truth, as God has instructed him to do, and the water would come forth and the people's thirst would be satisfied. But he yielded to pride. Now, what did God do in this case? He still provided water from the rock, right? We see that. Water gushed forth from the rock and the, the people were satisfied. Why did God do this? He did this because he loved the people despite the fact that they were ungrateful to him for all of his provisions of manna and quail and water when they needed it. They were ungrateful, but God still had compassion upon them. And despite Moses' disobedience, God met their need. Now Moses is disobedience in the context because what? What he set out was accomplished. The people got the water. The water gushed out. The staff did its job. No, it didn't do its job. God did it because of his good heart towards the people. Moses' disobedience might not sound like a, great, a big deal, but in reality, the reality was that it was a huge deal to God. Moses thought he needed to get more personally involved than what God had asked of him. He wanted the people's need to be met. He wanted to show the Israelites somehow that the gift God had given him was necessary for God's miracles to occur. How wrong he was. And what a terrible price he paid. The touch of God was what gave the staff that Moses gave, was given by God its power. 
without the power of God, the staff was just an ordinary stick. Moses didn't have what it took to meet the people's needs. See, Moses in this case here, he abused the leadership gift that God gave him as he disobeyed the Lord, costing him this huge thing. He and Aaron were not the source of God's provision or power. Moses, despite him being one of history's most revered saints, and, and the Bible does speak highly of Moses as one who believed, he along with all of the other grumbling and complaining people of that generation were because from seeing God's promise fulfilled in the promised land. Because of their disobedience, God told them that they were not going to be able to enter the land. Moses and Aaron and most of the Israelites did not get to see the blessings of God of entering this promised land that God had brought them out of Egypt to go to. It didn't have to be that way. Choices. It didn't have to be that way. Because of their choices, they were turned back into the desert and had to wander around aimlessly for more time till they actually died. Verse 12, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These waters were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was provided, he, he was proved holy among them. Meribah. They'd been there before. I don't know if they had to go back there again. There's so many lessons on human nature to be taken from this story of Israel's journey. And you see this again. Folks, I want you to be very clear. This story was given to us as a warning, not as a prophecy of what has to happen for us today, but as a warning to show us how our nature, if we allow, can take us to disobedience and we miss out on the great provisions that God has planned for us if we would only obey. See, there were, not everybody was kept out of the land of promise. There was just a few, but Joshua and Caleb were permitted to go in. They went in and they saw God deliver Jericho. They saw the land of Canaan that God had given as an inheritance to His people. Friends, this is a multifaceted lesson. Okay? Egypt represents different things in different contexts that God teaches us. The desert represents different things in context with God teaches, what God teaches us. The land of promise represents different things in context with what God is teaching. If we obey the Lord and allow Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Passover lamb, to lead us into life, we're going to go through the desert, yeah, but you know, we don't have to go through the desert our whole lives and endlessly cycle in the land of the desert of Zin, that dry, parched wilderness. <laughs> if we trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not on our own understanding, if we Acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways. He will make our path straight. And He'll take us through the desert to the promised land. What does the promised land in this context represent? It represents the blessing and the provision that God desires to lavish upon His children. You see, even Moses, the greatest among them almost, he would say, faltered and he wasn't able to experience this land of promise. While others, like Joshua and Caleb, trusted the Lord and God permitted them to enter. The rest of them cycled around. 
as Christians, God set us free. God has given us provisions to bear much fruit, and that's his desire. So don't say to yourself, we're ever, forever going to cycle in the land of Zim. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways, and he will make your path straight. And the fruit of righteousness will be given unto you, not because you possess it, not because you deserve it, but by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, the fruit of righteousness will be laden on the boughs of your life so that you and your family can give glory to the one who deserves it all, who paid the price for us. That's the, the calling, the glorious calling. So I hope today that we will take stock. Ponder the path that our footsteps trod. And Lord, have mercy upon us. God, help us to buck the trend of the sin nature that always doubts, that always worries, that always is anxious. And let us serve you with unbridled love. Amen.